Well, a warm welcome to everyone joining us online for the 2021 Sydney Southeast Asia Centre's Politics in Action event and our Cambodia update. My name is Christy Ward and I'm from the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre at the University of Sydney. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which this meeting is being hosted, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which you're joining us from today. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Astrid Noren Nilsson for our Cambodia update. Dr. Noren Nilsson is an Associate Senior Lecturer at the Centre for East and Southeast Asian Studies at Lund University. Her research focuses on the politics of Cambodia in the post-conflict reconstruction era, including the politics of memory, political and civil society elites, and nationalist imaginings in multi-party elections. So we're absolutely delighted and very lucky to have Astrid with us today. Astrid's presentation on the current political situation in Cambodia will be followed by 10 minutes of Q&A time. Please do post your short questions in the Zoom Q&A throughout the presentation and I'll direct them to Astrid during our Q&A time. Once again, thanks Astrid for joining us and over to you. Great, thank you so much, Christy, for this introduction and for having me. So um, current political developments in Cambodia, they are driven by the long incumbent Cambodian People's Party, the CPP, giving shape to the new project of rule that it first installed over 2017 and 2018, when the opposition party, the CNRP, was dissolved and a single party parliament consisting only of CPP MPs was elected. And so that shift from competitive authoritarianism, where electoral competition is real but unfair, to hegemonic authoritarianism, where there is no real electoral competition, has forced a complete reset of the political scene. Uh, and the new project of rule, which had um, uncertain contours of first, is now solidifying. So I would like to suggest that right now is a momentous point in time for the CPP to rebuild and strengthen and at the same time future-proof its dominance of Cambodia in the shadow of the pandemic, of course. So emblematic of the CPP's intention to future-proof its dominance is the newly built 40 million US dollar party headquarters in Phnom Penh, which you see on, on the slide, uh, which was inaugurated in last year uh, last year, and which Prime Minister Hun Sen presented as a sign that the CPP will continue to lead Cambodia over the next 50 years or even 100 years. And he also judged that the opposition should wait until the next life if they want to take power. So the new headquarters, they project the power of the CPP and the continued primacy of the party as a locus of power and key actors from various state institutions and beyond involved in the country's deepening authoritarianism have been integrated into its central committee. Now, the CPP, uh, of course, remains dominated by Prime Minister Hun Sen, who has increasingly personalized power and who last year proclaimed that he intends to remain in power for another decade. And so this delays the generational power shift that was widely expected to take place uh, during the 2020s. And Hun Sen also confirmed that he's grooming his oldest son, uh, Hun Manait, to take over leadership. So both the delay of a power handover as well as the anointment of a successor um, uh, reflects Hun Sen's caution in organizing his safe withdrawal um, from politics. So this prolonged time frame affords the idea of Hun Manait as prime minister to take root in society, minimizing risk in connection with the future uh, transition. Uh, dynastic uh, succession is not limited to the prime minister's family, but importantly relies also on managing hereditary succession among loyal uh, elites who are tied together through intermarriage into a web of political families. So the science of uh, Hun Sen's allies are groomed and promoted for leading positions within the state, party, military, and business. And this process was already kicked off uh, in 2013 and is ongoing. So while observers have generally expected a generational uh, handover, a transfer of power to, 
take place ahead of a particular election year, the current dynamics rather seem to suggest an ongoing and seamless generational transfer of power with a successive replacement uh, of older elites by the children to be followed in the very last instance by the replacement of the prime minister uh, himself. Now, the new political order entails an uh, aggressive reduction of political space in Cambodia that by now has revealed itself as intended to really blot out remaining opposition from uh, Cambodian soil. So the government's strategy is to make sure that former CNRP leaders who are outside the country remain outside the country and that those that are inside are dissuaded from continuing their activities uh, by legal uh, action. So in March this year, Sam Rainsi and other senior leaders were uh, convicted for uh, attempting to return in Cam to Cambodia in 2019, what has been framed as a coup attempt, and Sam Rainsi was handed a 25-year prison sentence, and his colleagues all between 20 to 22 years, and they were not allowed to return to Cambodia to attend the trial. And the uh, excited leaders, uh, they have few or no remaining cards up their sleeves. Uh, the EU decision in February uh, last year to partially suspend uh, Cambodia's preferential uh, trade agreement under the everything but arms scheme over the human rights situation was celebrated at the time by the opposition as a win, but really uh, in a sense amounted to a loss uh, in the sense that the review process failed to push for the CNRP's reinstatement that they had hoped for. And the global pandemic has also hit the transnationalized political opposition hard has uh, socially distanced the leaders uh, from their supporters around the world and also prevented them from touring together the support uh, of, of other governments. And CNRP supporters at home, meanwhile, uh, faced arrest and the mass trials that the opposition leaders were prevented from attending. So around 150 members and supporters of the band CNRP, but also other critics of the government, faced treason and uh, incitement charges. Now, one measure that could break this impasse is if the CPP will concede uh, former CNRP president Kumsuk has some sort of formal political role ahead of the 2023 general election. Uh, Kumsuk has still faces trial for treason. The trial has been suspended due to the pandemic. And meanwhile, he remains under court imposed bail conditions, uh, which include a ban on participating in politics. Now, the tried and tested method for his political rehabilitation would be for Kumsuk to be found guilty of treason and then swiftly handed a pardon. Now, for some analysts, this would amount to, to playing the prime minister's game, uh, but arguably, though, uh, the presence of a, of a reasonably credible opposition party on the ground represents the best hope there is uh, for gradual change back to politics with some competitive elements and would help liberalise the overall political uh, environment. Uh, but it is unclear if either side is unwilling to experiment with this formula from the government point of view, the main purpose would be to give uh, the next ballot greater legitimacy. But the government is deeply invested in building up alternative sources of legitimacy, which replace that granted by competitive politics. And as for Kumsoka, his provincial visits over 2020 uh, seem to suggest an ambition to maintain and cultivate grassroots support, uh, leaving the door open for the resumption of future political leadership in some form. Right, and uh, in terms of challenges then to this new project of rulers, I had uh, chosen to call it, well, uh, measures gambled on by the West to help restore competitive politics in Cambodia, they haven't balanced, pushed Cambodia further into China's orbit. So uh, the European Union's partial withdrawal uh, of trade preferences under the EBA scheme took effect in August last year. And in March, the European Parliament passed a resolution uh, on the mass trials in Cambodia, which calls on all EU member states to suspend bilateral funding to the government uh, and also uh, calls for the EU to use its new Magnitsky Act to impose individual sanctions with asset freezes and travel bans. And it's really the latter sanctions that the opposition is putting uh, their hope to at the moment. 
Uh, and under the Biden administration, US pressure on Cambodian issues of democracy and human rights have also increased. So in December last year, the US declared that to access further funding, uh, Cambodia would have to demonstrate uh, progress on human rights, but also to assert its sovereignty against China. Uh, but these funds are really of limited value to Cambodia and the tone at this point solely alienating uh, to Cambodia, which embraces China and regional integration without any hesitation. So in recent months, uh, bilateral uh, free trade agreements were concluded both with China and then with South Korea. And Cambodia has also become a signatory of the regional comprehensive economic uh, partnership. Uh, meanwhile, independent civil society is incapacitated by how independent voices are lumped together as critics with links to the outlawed opposition party. So the uh, Civicus Monitor in 2020 has rated the civic space in Cambodia as repressed, uh, pointing to the use of incitement laws to prosecute uh, land environmental human rights defenders, trade unionists, journalists, youth activists, and even rappers in this escalation of repression that we have seen over the last year. So uh, a recent development also appears to be how also service delivery and development NGOs that until now operated in a rather beneficial environment compared to advocacy NGOs, how they are also increasingly subject to suspicion by the authorities. Uh, now, in parallel, we see the growth of civil society organizations and networks that are loyal to the government, uh, mostly operating under a youth umbrella. So these particularly target urban middle class youth, to which they hold out a promise of upward mobility and close interaction with the state bureaucracy in some cases. And this contributes to the depoliticization of a section of youth that was previously a power base for the political opposition. Uh, and the core of these initiatives is often made up of civil servants, so it's simultaneously then extending ruling elites uh, hold over the state bureaucracy and youth. So it appears that the CPP setting out to adapt really remains uh, the party of the state and its bureaucracy, uh, but largely left out of government strategizing are rural youth, uh, many of whom lack access to quality education and are also predominantly employed in precarious work. Now, for most of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has uh, boosted the government's claim to leadership. So firstly, Cambodia until recently had among the lowest case numbers in the world, thanks to a robust public health response. And this has been a source of nationalist pride among Cambodians. And uh, these sentiments were triggered already in back in February 2020, when Cambodia accepted the, the international cruise ship MS Westerdam that you see here to dock in Sihanoukville after it had been turned away by several countries for fear of spread of the pandemic. And uh, a small country with a big heart became this social media slogan. Uh, secondly, there are also indications that Chinese face mask diplomacy and then followed by vaccine diplomacy, has improved the image of China among the Cambodian general public, uh, which is in general rather hostile to increase Chinese uh, presence and influence in Cambodia. So Cambodia was the first country to receive large amounts of Chinese medical supplies. China has donated uh, 1 million doses of the Sinopharm vaccine and Cambodia has additionally purchased the Sinovac vaccine. And the government has also taken the opportunity to address the pandemic in tandem with the outlawed opposition. So in March uh, last year, the state of emergency law was passed, which enables the state of emergency to be declared not only during pandemics, but also in the scenario of severe chaos to national order, national security and order. Uh, and this is rhetoric that was used to justify the dissolution of the CNRP and also against former CNRP activists that are now facing trials. And now in March, the government passed a new COVID-19 law that imposes fines and uh, or prison terms up to 20 years uh, when breached. And so far, more than 250 people have been arrested under the law. Uh, and finally, uh, the pandemic by deflecting world uh, attention has sheltered the, the government from international scrutiny. So an illustrative um, example is again the docking here of MS uh, Westerdam. Um, so uh, 
that took place the very week that uh, the partial lifting of the EBA was announced. So it really shifted the international media narrative on the Cambodian government away from the EU's allegations of democratic erosion to a different narrative of uh, international solidarity and humanitarian action. Uh, now, since February, the pandemic has taken a new turn uh, with a steep rise in cases, which threatens to reverse these gains in government legitimacy. So in response, the government has uh, imposed a raft of measures and the areas, for example, areas with high rates of uh, cases have been designated as red zones. And uh, the around 300,000 residents of these areas have been living in a strict lockdown. And there are reports that the government has not managed to adequately supply food to the red areas. Uh, the government denies this. Um, also jeopardizing the national narrative is the uh, disruption of livelihoods, which has hit particularly hard at the garment, uh, tourism and construction sectors. So the economy contracted by 3.1%. Uh, last year, which is the sharpest decline in Cambodia's recent history, and around 500 factories are currently closed, with 500,000 uh, garment workers under lockdown, and uh, the factory owners have no obligation to support their employees during the lockdown. And we have seen uh, over the past year that thousands of garment workers have protested over unpaid wages from suspended factories due to this uh, uh, the COVID-19 impact. So absent the swift reining in of the virus, the disruption of these and other livelihood trajectories may come to dominate the national um, interpretation of the crisis. Uh, yet on balance, such um, historic economic hardship and discontent appears in no position to fundamentally challenge the CPP rebuilding itself and its basis to lead Cambodia. Uh, really testifying to the strength of the CPP's new project of rule. And I think I will end here. I see Christy popping up on my screen. Thanks, Astrid, and thanks for those um, terrific insights into Cambodia's shifting uh, and current political landscape. We have quite a few questions for you in the Q&A. Thank you to all of our participants for posting your questions. Um, the first one is uh, about the depoliticisation of youth. What has the depoliticisation of youth meant for the continuation and succession of the current regime? Is there active grooming within the party for future leaders or is this not an issue? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. I think it's an incredibly interesting one. I've been working on this topic actually for the past two years or so and I have a, finally have an article coming out on it hopefully um, in August this year. But I think it's, an, it's important to not to take it for granted that youth today in Cambodia is some sort of an inherent progressive force. We saw that in 2013 and 2017, the indications were that it was really uh, youth who were driving that political moment to a great extent, which I think is, is true. Uh, but things have shifted since then. I think we can see uh, fragmentation within youth between those who were there to experience the moment, the, the democratic moments we can see in 2013, and those who were not. So there are sort of generations within the youth category, as it were. Uh, then we have the, um, around 2000, really, I think in 2012, so even predating the 2013 elections, we have the third Congress of what became the, the UYFC, right? Um, and that organization headed by the prime minister's third son, Hun Mani, has been incredibly important um, for uh, engaging youth in different initiatives. And like I just mentioned, so these are one of the initiatives that I thought of when I said that it primarily seems to target urban uh, middle-class youth. So there's also a range of spin-off initiatives, um, but that really involve uh, some of the same key people uh, that have been very successful in mobilizing youth towards social and cultural uh, activities, uh, which is, of course, also a form of depoliticization. 
Okay, that's true. Um, the next question is about the removal of the EBA. And the question is, what is your view on the removal of the EBA by the EU? What have been its, what have been its effects? Has it enhanced the significance of China in Cambodia? I think the, the short answer to that question is yes. Uh, I think that the EU had a reasonable expectation that uh, pushing, uh, using the threat of uh, lifting the EBA uh, as leverage, they had a reasonable expectation that that might contribute to some sort of uh, change, some sort of restoration of some, some form of competitive politics, competitive element in politics. And they, uh, of course, had to push that to the very end. But then what we saw uh, at the end of that entire process was uh, really um, really the pushing of Cambodia into further into China's orbit. Um, so I think there was, it was reasonable to, there were reasonable expectations behind the EU's move, but the way that uh, this crit crystallized, the way that this materialized is that there were no democratic gains to be had, but it, the, 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 the effect has really been um, to, 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 to push Cambodia further to China. Thanks Astrid. Uh, the next question is from Nikki Duncan. What are the implications for Cambodia's development resulting from Hun Sen's increasing control? What do you think his vision of livelihood trajectories mean for everyday people and all marginalised poor? Right. Uh, it's a really important question, a huge uh, question, of course. Uh, but the, the ambition of the government is, of course, to raise Cambodia's status and become a higher middle income country uh, by 2030. Um, and um, what we see is really that um, I think when this, the CPP is reinventing, it, reinventing itself and re, it, it keeps the same sort of core constituencies. So we do not see it really appealing much to those who are left out of Cambodia's current development trajectory we don't see them we don't see the party re really reaching out its hands very much to those who are disadvantaged by the development trajectory uh, but instead we see the building of loyalties with certain core bases and particularly with the urban middle class now to the exclusion uh, of those disadvantaged and uh, i expect that to continue So our final question is from Jennifer Kari. We do have many more questions than um, Astrid is able to answer. So thank you everyone for, for posting them. The final question is, what signs of hope do you see for the future in Cambodia? What is necessary for the return of competitive elections? Um, I, I think it would have to be something very gradual. Uh, uh, so like I, uh, I, I also mentioned, I think that you know, potential restoration of Kamsaka to a political role, any move really in the direction of having credible opposition in place would change uh, you know, texture of everyday life for people. And I think that would have a, a big effect in the long run. Uh, so I think that's not to be neglected, but I think in these discussions, there's often an assumption that you know this is what the, the government's preferred course of action. But, but, but really, I, I cannot see that the government has many incentives to go ahead with this because what we see is the government building a really new product of rule that sets aside sets aside uh, the competitiveness of politics, and it's not really fundamental to them anymore. So uh, I think we should. Re we consider how, how we how we frame uh, this negotiation as something that would be, in my view, would be hugely uh, helpful, and not only for this you know particular section of the opposition, but really for everyday life in Cambodia, uh, rather than something that would you know squarely benefit the government. Thanks, Astrid. Well, thank you to all of our participants for joining us for the twenty twenty. One Politics in Action Cambodia update. Thanks again to Astrid. You've shown us that uh, Cambodia's political situation is one uh, on the one hand at an impasse, but on the other hand, undergoing quite significant change. So thanks for joining us, Astrid, and thanks for your insights. Yeah. Thanks very much.